welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. It's good to see you all this morning. I can tell from all the energy, several young, uh, young people, got a balcony full of young people. Everyone is excited about the new school year, right? Or maybe you're thinking we can just pray it away. I don't, know. I don't know what your feelings are, but welcome today to this time of worship. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together. It's good to seek God's presence together, and, and I believe that God has a blessing in store for all of us as we worship him and as we lay our cares before him today. I'd like to welcome those who are visiting us uh, this morning. We are glad that you're here as well. Um, if you would like to connect with the church, uh, the, the back of this bulletin has a little perforated thing where you can fill it out and tear it out. And, um, and later at the end of the service, you can bring that by and leave it an offering plate. And we would love to uh, be able to follow up with you and see how we might can minister to you and to your family. And uh, if you do, do uh, happen to fill out one of those, just know we will not randomly show up at your home, but we would love to be able to connect and see uh, uh, how you might be able to join uh, this family of God. Um, I would like to remind you that uh, for giving of tithes and offerings, again, we are still not passing the offering plate, but you can drop those in the offering plates at the front of the sanctuary and at the back um, at the end of the service, or you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org or bring them or mail them to the office during the week. We'd like to remind you uh, that there are a couple of collections that are continuing through the month of August. One is for the soup kitchen and the other is for school supplies. You can see all the details there in uh, the bulletin for that, so we want to make you aware of it. Um, today, as I've already mentioned, we will have the blessing of the new school year, and at the end of the service, um, if you're comfortable staying, there will be a church-wide cookout. We decided to do a cookout instead of a covered dish to try to limit um, all the hands that are doing the preparing and everything. Uh, so uh, Holly has um, headed that up, and uh, at the end of the service, we'll have a blessing for that. And if you're not staying, I guess that'll serve as a blessing for your food wherever you go uh, to eat lunch. Um, if you're a youth, do know that this evening um, at 5 p.m., y'all will be visiting uh, the creamery and then having your annual shaving cream fight. So make sure you bring some towels and, uh, and youth parents have your washing machine ready when they get home. I guess that's uh, part of that announcement. So I'd like to uh, now in invite you. Oh, uh, let me say one more word of welcome. We welcome back Terrence Blue, who is uh, leading in our worship service um, this morning uh, and playing the trumpet. We are thankful uh, for your continued uh, coming and, and being here with us and, and sharing of your gifts and talents and worship. So at this time, I'd like to invite you, though, to join your hearts and minds uh, with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your presence with us. We are thankful that there is no place that we can go to escape your presence. And uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, this morning as we gather to worship that you're with us in a very special way. We pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us and direct us into becoming the people that you've called us to be. So as we uh, begin this time of worship, Lord, we lay our cares at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning the psalm comes from Psalm chapter 34, verses 15 through 22. You'll see the scripture there on the screen as well. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against, against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Would you please join me in prayer? Father, as we pause this morning to, to seek you, uh, we recognize that you're on your throne. We recognize that while this world may be in turmoil and while there's a lot of chaos right now that, that, that you know and are aware of it, and battles while they rage the war, will not end differently. We're promised in the scriptures, Lord, that, that you win, that your people win. That while it may seem to us that you're slow in fulfilling the promises that you made through Jesus, you're doing that out of, out of patience and out of love that no one's life would end without having a chance to respond to the good news of Jesus. To have a saving relationship with him. Lord, this week has been a, a difficult one to look at the, the news reports on the things that are going on in Afghanistan. Lord, many families here have been affected, loved ones given their lives for the sacrifice of the good of other people. There are many who are having flashbacks to uh, 9-11 20 years ago and to the evil of that day. And feelings that everything has been lost. There are men and women in Afghanistan right now, children whose lives are forever going to be different. And Lord, we pray. We pray that the good will come out of what seems really bad. We hold on to the truth that good does overcome evil. We hold on, on to the truth that there will be 
a creation, a space one day, what we call heaven, where there will be no evil anymore, no more crying, no more mourning, no more death, no more pain. All those things will pass away. We believe in the day that the people who have been persecuted and martyred for their faith, that it will all be worth it as they see you face to face. We hang on to those things. And yet we still fight in the realm of prayer and in the realm of, uh, of, 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 of our troops and of our nation going into other places and hard places in the world to bring better outcomes than there are right now where tyranny rules. God, we're reminded that we live in a broken state, yet, God, your kingdom is coming to bear through us, through your people. So this morning, God, we lay those things at your feet. We acknowledge that in, in many ways we are, we are dumbfounded and clueless and so frustrated when things like that happen. Lord, there, there are people here in our own, own church, in our own community who are fighting other illnesses and battles right now as well. And we pray for your movement in their lives. God, we do pray that you would show us how we can be your hands and feet. How we can be good news to those around us. God, we pray for, uh, as we find ourselves uh, with a pandemic that is, has a new surge, Lord, we pray for, for those things to flatten and drop. Help us to do our part, even if it's not comfortable. God, we pray that the day will come when this can be declared over and things can get back to some sort of normalcy. But God, we, we recognize that in reality, normal, normalcy is a myth. That every day has a new adventure and every day brings a new possibility of us being able to walk with you, to experience you. So God, as we pray, as we worship, as we seek you this morning, we pray that you would bring things into focus for us. That you would help us realize how blessed of a people that we are. And help us realize that we have a responsibility in our blessing to be a blessing to others. And this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And it's in Jesus' name we continue to worship. At this time, I'd ask all students, whether elementary, high school, college, or adult education, to all stand and come and fill the spaces of the aisle and the front of the church with your backpacks if you have them. This also applies to any administrators, teachers, anyone who works in any way with the school. This does include y'all as well. So please now stand up and come and fill the bottom. Please distance as well. to read a verse this morning and I want y'all to hear the word first from Joshua 1 9 this is my command be strong and courageous do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go I know over the last year and month all of you have faced difficulty but it's a new school year it's a new beginning so encouraging y'all each to be fearless, to be strong, to be courageous, and face this year knowing that God is with you. Tomorrow, teachers, children, administrators, cooks, drivers, whoever, all start a new year. The backpacks that some of them have with them and some of them have at home are kind of a symbol 
these backpacks will be filled with homework, school supplies, permission slips, report cards, notes, and so much more. Some days they're going to be stuffed so full you can barely zip it, and some days they'll be practically empty. But it's going to be a staple for each of these kids every day from now until the end of the year in May and June. That represents everything they're going to learn this year. It represents them studying and growing this year in all that they do, whether it's through their school, through their church, through their sports, whatever they're involved in, their dance. This is how they're learning and they're growing, and that book tag is a symbol of that. We have a time now to show them that if they're not alone, Yes, they walk with God, but they also walk with us as a church family. So I want you this week, especially tomorrow and each and every day of the school year, to pray for all the individuals you see here, all the ones that are worshiping online as well, and the ones that couldn't be here. Pray for the students, the administrators, the teachers, everyone who has a hand in these kids' education. And then pray for the parents and spouses of these people, because they need it too. Because there's going to be days when parents are ready to pull their hair out. So pray for them all. Today, tomorrow, and as the year goes on. I'm going to now ask that everybody stand up where you are if you're able. And turn to the students. Face the students if you're not already. And we're going to pray over these students and bless their school year. So let's pray. Creator God. We pray for these children, these youth, these adults before us this morning. We pray for your blessing on their lives as students, teachers, and administrators. We pray for your blessing on these backpacks, that they wear them to and from school every day and carry them with you. As they carry them, help them remember that our church family, this church family, is surrounding them. The backpacks may get stuffed and dirty, but pray that with each step of the way they know that they are loved and that they're in Jesus' hands always. We pray for the teachers of the school and all the adults who make the school run. We thank you for their calling to teach, to be a, a presence in these lives. We pray that you would bless their school year and help them to know that this congregation, these people, your people, surround and love them too. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. My adults can be seated. My students, before you sit, on the chairs and the communion table behind you, behind you and at the front, there is a book bag tag that you can put on your book bag. Inside is a kindness card, just to remember to be kind and that you can make it through each and every day, along with a wooden cross to remember to keep God with you always. Please take one of those and then head back to your seat. Thank you. Be no kingdom kids today but children seven and under can go to the nursery.
So by, I want to show our hands. I have a question to begin my sermon with. The question is, do you think that at some point in the next 30 minutes, Holly Sloan will realize that she took my sermon? <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. So, hey, we'll see how this goes. Maybe it'll work out better. Um, it's, it's gone. It's, I had it right here, and it is gone. So this week, um, this week is the final week of a sermon series that I'm, I've been preaching called Battle Ready. Over the first, uh, the first sermon, uh, way back, I think we might have been in July when we started this uh, sermon series, was called The Battle for Priority and how important it is in our lives that we understand that our priority as Christians is called to be Jesus and our relationship with Jesus and how if our priority and the way we act and the way we live and the, the, the way that, thank you so much. So if anyone put a bed on the first couple minutes, you get the money. Our priority, if our priority is Jesus, everything else falls in to line. The second week we considered the battle for unity, how there's such diversity in the world that we live in and the country that we're citizens of that the true call of Christians, and if there's anywhere that there should be unity, it should be in the body of Christ. We are called to be unified in our love for Jesus and in the mission that he has given us. And then I took a week off when we had our youth group uh, report on their um, mission week. And then this past Sunday, I preached a sermon called The Battle for Courage. And we considered ways that we're called to be courageous and while there's many examples in the scriptures of the call that we have to courage, uh, maybe the, the most courageous things that we can do right now is go into the places where Jesus is calling us and stand and do the work that he's calling us to do. And today the sermon is not called the battle for something, it's called wear your armor. And this will be the final in this series. The premise of this series has been that God is calling us individually and corporately to join him in his kingdom work. And that kingdom work changes. It changes year to year. It changes generation to generation. There are new opportunities. And every time God's people organize to follow Jesus in the calling that we have, there will be opposition. There will be opposing forces. We see that as for sure all throughout the scriptures. That any time God's people follow him and follow his lead, there is opposition to it. But if we have the courage to battle, to battle for priority, for unity, for courage, to put on the full armor of God as we're going to learn today, God will do exceedingly more than we could ask or imagine in our communities, in our churches, in our schools. And so that is, that is where this battle-ready sermon is coming from. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians was written by Paul to the churches that are scattered around Ephesus in 62 AD. And the purpose was the work of Jesus Christ, making sure that they understood the, the saving work of Jesus. Jesus didn't come just to show what, to be a good role model of, of, of how to, to live and, and how to act and how to treat people. He actually also came to lay down his life to make it possible that, that we could be fully forgiven once and for all for our sin. And so when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us that we are forgiven of our sin and we're gifted the Holy Spirit. And then as we stand before God, we're not seen as sinners any longer, but we're seen as his saints and as his sons and daughters. That is good news. And so he wrote this book for the unity of of the church and proper conduct in the church and in the home and in the world. And then as he closes the book of Ephesians, this letter to those churches, the closing image is of Christians to put on this armor of God as they join God in the work of bringing people into a saving relationship with Jesus. And so if you like to take notes, anyone a note taker? Anyone so excited that school's starting back and you get to take some notes tomorrow? If you like to take notes, in, here in our bulletin, there's a little section for that. And I, I'd encourage you, this is one of those sermons where uh, you can nail down the notes pretty good. It all kind of starts with the, the same phrasing. What must we do to win the battle? Well, there are things that we must know. To win the battle, we must know some things. We must 
use our brain. We must have a strategy. Anyone like sports? Anyone like sports? I was recently thinking about my sports days, and when I, when I was in uh, junior varsity and varsity, most of the time the sports teams that I played on, we had a plan. So I had to dial it back and figure out when was a time that I played sports and we really didn't have a plan, and that would have been Little League Baseball. Anybody remember Little League Baseball or T-Ball? I mean, T-Ball, I mean, it's just like you're just whacking the ball off the stick and everything. But then, you know, you go where I grew up, it went from T-Ball, then they called it Pee Wee League, and you had a little pitching machine. And then I guess, um, I don't know the age, maybe 9 or 10 is when you got into Little League. And so, you, you know, you're pitching, uh, you're actually playing real baseball, but like six or seven inning games. Um, but that was, I loved, I loved baseball. Baseball is, is one of my favorite, still one of my favorite sports. And um, on my Little League baseball team, uh, I, was, I played on that team for four years. And the first, second, and third year, we were terrible. Anybody ever been on a bad team? Like the bad news bears seemed like you didn't win any, like that was kind of what, it was bad. It was bad. We didn't have, uh, we had some players, we had enough to, to stand on the field, but that was about it. I mean, like lots of, of, of other teams were hitting inside the park home runs on us. Anytime, like guys, anytime you hit an inside the park home run, it means you're playing against a team that's not very good, right? Right, that's what that means, okay? Uh, so we were that team. We were, we were the Watson Chevrolet A's in Scotland Neck. And, um, and ironically, um, Watson Chevrolet was owned by um, Raymond Watson, who is now my mom's boyfriend, okay? And so we actually made Raymond proud, though. My fourth year, um, we went into, everyone gets into the playoffs in Little League, okay? Well, we had never had a plan. I mean, it was just you get up there and throw balls, pitch the ball, try to get three outs, get back in, and then you try to hit the ball. That was pretty much it. Um, but my last year, we had two good pitchers, uh, and uh, one of them was named Henry. And um, Henry, uh, compared to me, I'm not the tallest person. Um, Henry would be like, in Little League, like me standing beside Chris Tomlin, our, our youth minister, Chris Tomlin. Um, you know, there's another Chris Tomlin who's really a short Worship leader, anybody know that? Anyway, um, so Chris Tom, it would be like that difference. And Henry could throw a fastball, but that was about it. And when Henry got a little shaky with his fastball, started throwing it a little inside or a little outside, I'd go up to Henry. I'm about like, Henry, you might as well just hit him. You're throwing it fast. Just go ahead and hit him. That's one pitch instead of four to walk him. And I go back down, and he would put, I mean, he would smoke it. Then my, my catcher's mitt almost had a hole come out the back of it because he, I mean, he would put it right down the pipe. So Henry was our pitcher. And we made this plan going into, uh, into the tournament. This was the plan. We would make, we, we would get Henry to throw as many fastballs and strike as many people out as possible. When I needed to straighten him out, I'd go to the mound, I'd tell him to hit somebody, and he'd throw it even straighter. And, um, and our plan when we got up to bat was this. Our plan was we were not going to swing the bat. <laughs> and guess what? It worked. They would walk the bases loaded and then just walk us all the way in. They just kept, they just... The teams get until we got to the championship game. We made it all the way to the championship game, and we had to play um, like First Citizens Bank. They were like the Yankees. I mean, they were like really good, and we were like the Athletics. I mean, the A's. We were, you know, just barely scratching by. And our, our I remember our coach coming and telling us, he was like, all right, guys, we've had a plan to this point. It's going to have to change because they had some really good pitchers. So he said, the, the, the coach said this, he said, the, the plan is, they're going to probably throw it right over the plate, just swing as hard as you can. And so I don't know what in the world happened, but we piled it on. We got hit after hit after hit. Henry threw him right down the middle. We struck almost every batter out, and we won the championship. And now my mom's boyfriend somewhere has this big trophy. Um, maybe I can get it one day. But, you know, when you go into a battle, whether it's sports or whether it's the battle of life, you got to know some things if you want to be successful, right? you got to have some sort of of a plan. And I think that as Paul is finishing this letter to the churches in Ephesus, he's giving them this image of a plan that they need to have, that they're going to actually know the work of Jesus and be effective in reaching people for Jesus, helping people come into a saving relationship with Jesus. If the church is going to have this order for its worship, and these, the family is going to have order, and all these things, if you're going to be able to, to, to be the people that God is calling you to be, you've got to know some things. And so we're going to read the scripture, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. 
Then I'm going to talk about the few things that we want to know, we need to know, we need to remember. And, um, and uh, I, hope, I, hope that, I hope that we'll take this, this call to battle seriously because it's a spiritual thing. Sometimes in the churches we don't like to use the word battle. But as we look at the Gospels, we see that Jesus battles, battles, battles. But it's not, a, it's not like a human war. Paul, Paul says it like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the gospel, the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it, 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 it is inspired by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that it is, it is useful for teaching and for rebuking, for training us up to be who you've called us to be. Lord, help us to take seriously the battle that we are in, whether we realize it or not. Until you come, Lord, we are in a battle. And so let us find ourselves joining you in the fight. And let us see the success around us as people come to know Jesus, in your holy name we pray, amen. All right, three things that we must know to win the battle. First, we must know our enemy. If I was to ask you who your enemies are, who our enemies are, I'm sure we could make a long list, right? (laughs) We can make a long list of the people who disagree, the people who come against I'm sure it was no different for the church in Ephesus that they had this long list of people who were against them, people who were persecuting them, people who didn't think or believe like they did. But Paul tells them, he says here in verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So when we start making a list of enemies, the first thing we have to do to know our enemies is to realize it's not people. It's not people or a group of people or a religion. It's this, he says, our, but against, in verse 12, rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark, and, uh, and dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I did a lot of research on verse 12 this past week. I was really hoping that it would tell me that people are our enemies. I was really doing, because I, I'm, I'm, I was expecting on this verse to get some, some, fact check, some, some fact checkers, you know, go on you, wherever your fact checking website is, and that, hey, hey, I actually found this that said that no, our enemy is people, but scholar after scholar after scholar, scholars all over the board said that no, what Paul is saying is that our enemies, even when it says rulers and authorities, and we want to put certain people of power into those slots, it's... He, that Paul is not describing people, presidents, kings. He's describing this, the, the, these rulers and authorities, these powers of the dark world. These, these you know, we, we don't talk a lot about it in the church, but about Satan, about the devil, about demons. That that's, where the fle- that, that's where the fight is. That's who the enemies are. We must know who our enemies are. And our enemies don't like Jesus' work in the world. We see Isaiah 61, verse 1, and Isaiah 42, verse 7, and Psalm 102, 20, and Ezekiel 34, 27, and about 27 other scriptures throughout the Bible say that people, people who are lost, people who are in darkness, people who are doing evil, 
they're not enemies. They're prisoners. They're prisoners to the devil. They're prisoners to Satan. They're prisoners to demons. That's what the scriptures tell us. Nonetheless, sometimes we find people who, who, who are aligned with the dark powers of this present world. But we must understand, first and foremost, that even the worst of the worst are prisoners to darkness. And Paul knows it firsthand. Y'all remember what Paul's job was before he accepted the call to his ministry? He was a Jewish persecutor of the church. He went around murdering Christians. We trust about two-thirds of the New Testament, which has been written by his hand. We trust that to be the canon of our faith. So why can't we look at a person who is evil? Why can't we, and I know this is a stretch, but it must be said because it comes from the scriptures. Why can't we look at one of those, the the most evil of the evil in the Taliban and not think that the same outcome is possible for a person like that, which was possible for Paul? Because when we put our faith in Jesus, anything is possible. That That doesn't mean that people in this world who commit atrocities, who commit murder. There's not consequences that they must face up to. But when we, when, we set, when we set ourselves in a posture that people are beyond the redemption of God, we are not in a good place with God. Amen? The Bible says that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. It wasn't because we cleaned ourselves up real good, came to church every Sunday. No, we were still sinners. Christ died for us, we must know our enemy first and foremost. The second thing we must know is we must know what our armor is, what armor we're called to wear. In verse 13, Paul says, Put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with these things, okay? He says, With the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So he mentioned the full armor of God, what the armor of God is. And sometimes when we hear that list, this is what we actually hear. Belt, breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet. If we were going into a battle, those are the things we would probably want, right? Right? Let's just kind of, let's put it in fun terms. Let's say that, it's, that one of you were going to go play paintball. We, I know we got some paintballers in here. Any paintballers in here? I know we got one right here. Anybody play paintball ever? I see some guys up here in the, in the balcony. Think about this. If you're going to play paintball, these are the things you're going to want. You're going to ha- want to have a belt around your pants so they don't fall while you're running, getting shot in the back, right? You're going to want to have a breastplate. Anyone ever been shot in the, bre- in the chest? Like, you want me to tell you a story real quick? We got, a little, we got a little time for a little story. We got lunch right after the service. I, I got to tell you the story. Okay, we were playing uh, paintball, and uh, my uncle and my nephew wanted to go. My nephew at the time, uh, he was probably like Luke's age, and my uncle let him play. And so we're out there playing, and he's just a little bitty guy. So he's, you might have to adjust the camera for this, whoever's running the camera, so I don't just walk right out of it. So there's a little bunker, and um, my nephew's down, and uh, he's like all balled up. Imagine a little guy, and he's got his little gun right around, and they're coming right by my head. And so um, I'm like, I got to get around. So I see him pop back in, and I run to another bunker, and he doesn't know I'm there. And I get, I kind of, what's it called, flanking? Is that whatever? I got to his side, he didn't see me, and I just lit him up, pop, 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 pop. and um, he started crying. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, and my uncle's mad at me. Like, I mean, we're, this is the game. These are the rules. And so, like, I come up, like, I'm seeing my nephew cry, and I have compassion and pity on him, so I'm coming to him. And as I'm coming, as I'm walking to him, my uncle just pops right up, and he just pop, 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 right in the chest. And, y'all, I thought I was about to have a heart. I mean, the pain. That was like five, just do, 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 right there. It, he, he was a pretty good shot with that. He hadn't hit me before. That was the last time I played with my uncle and my nephew, so... In those moments, I wish I had a, like a chest protector, right? Had, had me a, my, my old catcher's uniform on. How about shoes? Anyone, you, you're going to want to wear shoes when you're trying to run, something with some good grip on them. Have a shield. That's a good part of armor, having a shield. And, of course, having a helmet, something to protect your head. See, this church in Ephesus, these folks knew about armor. They knew what, and Paul knew that they knew what good armor was, covering the vital parts of your body. 
But he tells them in the spiritual battle, the spiritual battle that you face as God is moving through this church, those are not the things that are most important. The most important things are this, that you're centering yourselves in truth. That the way you behave is in a righteous manner. That this gospel that you bring to people, that they understand it's a gospel of love and a gospel of peace. It's meant to bring peace into the lives of the hearers as they're absolved of the guilt that they carry and the shame that they carry when they realize that God is actually a loving God who sent his son to save them. Faith is a shield. Faith is something that you hold before you. What does it say there that, uh, in, um, in verse 16? In addition, I'll take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then to protect your head, the helmet of salvation. Knowing where your salvation is. Knowing who is your Savior. Know this. If you don't know anything else, know who Jesus is. Know your Savior. Those are all De- defensive parts of armor, right? I, um, I had this thought. You know, I, I was a youth minister before coming here. And um, oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe y'all, y'all youth were like, yeah, I can't wait to put this on my backpack. Anybody? I mean, like, the little, like Luke is jacked. I'm sure jacked up about this. But any of y'all youth were... Raise your hand, everyone raise your hand. Y'all are so excited about this and about putting it on your backpack, right? Some of y'all, look at that. Okay, those guys are like, I ain't, wearing, I ain't raising my hand for that. So, I know, y'all, I know that, like, like, sometimes we find ourselves in, like, the cool, like, just everybody, just not just the youth now, but, just, you know, sometimes we find ourselves, like, we want to be cool, right? Like, we want to be the cool Christian. It's kind of hip, and we're kind of in, like, in, you know, we hang out with that, you know, everybody. I don't know. Think about identifying yourself, putting something that's, I mean, Holly, you know, Holly spent the time doing this, says you are so very loved on one side, and on the other side it says your attitude determines your direction. And, you know, I'm not a student, but I have a backpack, and this thing is going on my backpack at the end of the service today because I don't mind making myself look like, like a fool or like, does that make sense? Like, sometimes when we put on, like, think of how foolish it was or it must have seemed to them when Paul's like, and, and they maybe are, are feeling like there's a possibility every day that we could be persecuted. Like, think of like a Christian in Afghanistan, knowing the, 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 the climate that they're living in, and for them to read these words, and to really want to have a belt, breastplate, shoe, shield, helmet. But Paul's saying, no, the more important thing is truth, righteousness, gospel, faith, and salvation. What if, we li- like, what if we really trust these words? And li- It might look foolish to everyone. It might feel like, and I, again, I'm not trying to put any youth on the spot, but like, I remember being a youth minister, and if I had given these to my youth, they would have left them in the youth room. That's just kind of how they roll. Um, but like, the one or two, though, who, who didn't mind like, letting everyone know that they're a Christian, letting every one of them know that they love Jesus, they, they, they live by a different standard than the world does that truth is important to them that living in a righteous way is important that knowing the gospel and living out the gospel is important that having faith even though they may be learning some things in school or other places that might challenge their faith that they can also still have faith and follow Jesus and that their savior they know who their savior is maybe that looks foolish to the world but I'd rather look foolish than be a fool amen you got to know your armor. You got to wear your armor. That's where the title for this comes. We, we sometimes in the church, we know our armor. We fail to put it on. The next thing we got to know is this. Y'all, y'all notice I left, I left something out, right? See, all those were defensive parts of your armor. You have to know your weapon. In verse 17, the, we read part of that. Take the helmet of salvation. But then he says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Any of y'all like military movies? Anybody? Like Saving Private Ryan or like, I mean, not like the, you know, like the Mission Impossible like stuff. I'm talking about like real nitty gritty stuff. You ever see them when they're in their downtime? What are they doing? A lot of times they're making sure their weapon, everything works. They know their weapon. 
Y'all, even Forrest Gump knew his weapon, right? Y'all see it? Every, every, great, every great soldier knows that they must know their weapon. Although it's important to defend yourself, that if the time comes, you need to be able to have an offensive weapon. And Paul doesn't say that it's a sword. Go out and buy a bunch of swords, buy a bunch of axes, get a bunch of torches, pitchforks, whatever, to the church in Ephesus. He tells them, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me ask you this. How well do you know the Word of God? Anybody ever set out to read the Scriptures, like, in a year? Genesis and Exodus go pretty good, right? Because they're narrative form. But once you get to Leviticus, it's kind of law, it's kind of broken up. And a lot of people drown in Leviticus they just, or just give up in Leviticus. You know, I talk with people a lot and I tell them, you know, the scriptures, the scriptures are more complex than sometimes we give them uh, the credit to be, right? Like, think about this. This is 66, this is actually a library, what we call our Bible is a, is a book of is 66 books put into one that spans a couple thousand years. There's a lot of stuff in there. Some of it's written in more of, a, of like a, a, a literary and poetic form. Some is command. Some is narrative. Some is eyewitness of Jesus. Others are letters. Others are, um, are prophecy. It's, it's kind of all over the board, yet it's this wonderful complex it's like a library that everything connects and it works together and i have found this to be true that people who win the battle of life the spiritual battle in life the people who cling to jesus they spend the time to know their weapon they spend the time knowing their weapon because it's through the weapon that the lord speaks to them amen if I, if I, have you ever like wondered or had someone ask you the question, I'll, get, I'll give you the answer to tell them. I've had people ask me, how, how, how do I know when God's speaking to me? And I'll tell them, well, the, if you want to figure it out, just go read the Bible and he'll speak to you. Like that's, if you want to know for sure that God is speaking to you, go and read the scriptures, study the scriptures, get yourself a nice study Bible that helps lay it out and puts the themes into perspective and shows you how the Old Testament is connected to the New Testament and that the book of Revelation is not actually like just an end time uh, left behind series book, but it actually was relevant for the people then and there's some relevant things today, but there's, it's a whole, you know, um, you don't freak yourself out going and reading the book of Revelation and not understanding what you're reading within, outside of its context. It's a beautiful book. It's a life-giving book. It's our weapon. So if you collected all three of, uh, of these points, you get to, uh, we'll give you lunch today. Um, so to win the battle, you must know your enemy. To win the battle, you must know your armor. To win the battle, you must know your weapon. And the next thing to do is to suit up, seek God, and to stand firm. Look at what he says in, in verse 18. We're good at that. Sometimes of that suiting up and that standing firm. But let's not overlook seeking God. Verse 18 says there, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Remember Paul? Paul was the guy who wrote, like, sometimes I don't know what to pray and I just groan. Like, I feel this thing just uh, word, groans that words can't express. He spent so much time in prayer. It wasn't just a, okay, I'm going to go and shut my eyes now. But it was, he, he lived a prayerful life. He says, but I pray, he, he's asking me to pray in the spirit on all these occasions with prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Can you go to the next slide for me? Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, think of God's people, uh, us being God's people. We're, we're suiting up, we're putting on the full armor of God, and we're standing firm in the places that he's put us. How beautiful would it be for us to then be a mouthpiece for God, a people pointing to Jesus? When we talk to him, like Paul's asking for the people to pray on his behalf, that he might know what to say. When we, when we talk to God, he in turn gives us things to do and things 
to say. I believe that I believe that in the coming months and years, and I've said this over the past few months, and I'm not giving up on it. I'm going to continue to believe it. That uh, I, be- I believe that we're going to eventually find ourselves at the end of this pandemic. I believe that God is going to show us new things to do. God is going to show us ways to do what we've been doing even better. God is going to give people in our congregation ideas for ministry, ideas for reaching out to people. But if we're not battling to stay close to Jesus, if we're not doing that work, I don't think it's going to happen. I, don't, I, I think that as we look in the scriptures, when the people really sought God and sought God in number, that's when the miraculous happened. That's when the supernatural entered communities. So, let me ask you, where, where do you stand in that battle? Where do you stand in a hard place right now? Where do you stand? I, I, I remember I, I hated the first day of school. Good night, I hated the first day of school. Whew. Anybody love the first? I mean, it's okay if you love it, you know, but ah, just summer's ending and all that stuff. I want to encourage our students just to see, like Holly said, or to see the possibilities that this year brings. These te- teachers and administrators, the possibilities that lay before you, the new people that you might get to meet, the new teachers you might have, the new things you're going to learn, the new experiences you might have on different sports teams. And to ask God to show you where you fit in with it, where your purpose is, and then battle to be there. This whole series began with a song. And um, y'all probably remember me playing it oh, if you were here for the first one. Uh, it's a song called Another in the Fire. And um, I, was, I just had had that on my mind a whole lot. And, and it, it's kind of born out of Daniel chapter 3. Anybody remember the name King Nebuchadnezzar? King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he was the king of Babylon. And he had, he had all these Jews that had been exiled from Jerusalem. They were... They were living in, in the country. They were being used as slaves in various ways, abused. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar in, in Daniel chapter 3, he decides that he's going to build a giant golden statue image thing. I mean, you know, I guess when you're the king, that's the kind of stuff you do. And, and then he decides to have a dedication. Gets all the people to come. And at this dedication, he sets the rules for his new image, his new statue. He says the rules for worship are this. When the music plays, and there were all these different instruments, when you hear them, everyone has to stop and bow and worship the golden image. Whoever does not stop and worship, they're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Y'all remember this, right? There were three Jews that lived there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were exiled in Babylon, and they would not worship the golden statue. They stood firm in their relationship with God. They sought God. They suited up with the armor that God gave them. They weren't going to bow. They weren't going to stoop. So they're brought to King Nebuchadnezzar, and then he questions them, and it goes like this. He he basically reminds them of what the rules are, and he says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You see, King Nebuchadnezzar, kings of that day, they believed that they themselves were God. They believed that if... If they were in power, that they were the ones to be worshipped. Not the, the Jewish kings were not like that, but the kings of all the other pagan nations were. What God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, they got some good armor on, don't they? Even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar is like, he's furious. And he orders the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commands his strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. And so these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. 
The king's command was so urgent that the furnace was, and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took them and threw them in there. And the three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Who's the son of God? Jesus. This is a, it was a, as we look back in the Old Testament, we see these bits and pieces where Jesus shows up in various ways, and this is one of the big ones. Many scholars believe that this is Jesus in the furnace with them. Nebuchadnezzar then approaches the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So, so they came out of the fire, and everyone's gathered around them. Then they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own. That last sentence has been a, a sentence that this week has, has shook me. In, in, in a good way, shook me towards Jesus, brought me to Jesus. I'm going to read it again. They were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any God except their own. I found this to be true. We battle for the things that we realize are important, don't we? Something's important enough, we, we fight for it. And those in our congregation who are older, you've been through more battles. God's taken you through more things. And you knew that those things in your life that are of immense value that you would go through a blazing furnace to protect them to take care of them to battle and so this morning I, I want to share that song again and I want to give a time of reflection for our church a time of, a time of prayer a time that we can also lift up and pray for other people in various places in the world who are going through a lot of stuff and um, I want to ask them some prompting questions before I sing this. And um, I want to just invite you into the battle, into your battle. You know, life doesn't just happen by accident. It really doesn't. So I want to encourage you. Where, where, do you, where do you need to surrender to God? Have you surrendered to God? I'm so excited to be at a church where, you know, we've kept, we've kept that baptismal pool going, kept the waters flowing in it. We're going to have a baptism in a couple weeks. And um, people stepping up in, in faith. I want to encourage that to, to keep happening. Keep, keep stepping up. If you haven't put your... Your faith in Jesus in a public way before the body of Christ. Maybe you have in private. Well, Jesus says we've got to also do that in public. I want to encourage you to let us know. Have you surrendered all that? Where do you need to join the, the body of Christ, the church, the army? Where do you need to stop trusting armor that won't save you? And, and, and where, just where are you in, in your battle? So... Um, I want to encourage you as I strum to just spend a little time talking to God and just want to remind you, you know, we're not doing an altar call right, right now because it's hard to receive people while I'm doing this. <laughs> but that I, I, I'm, I'm your pastor, and I'm here. My, you can get my phone number. You can come up to the office. You can, you can, it's easy to hunt me down. I live two blocks away. I'm here for you. I'm here to walk with you through that. Youth, you know, I'm here for you, but you've got an awesome youth minister who's there for you as well. Um. We have no reason that we, uh, we have no reason to not take the step that God calls us to in life. So whatever that is for you, I want to encourage you to take it.
There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free, there is a grave that holds nobody, and now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. There is another in the fire And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him And I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between wears thin I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls cave in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Would you stand with me for our benediction and also the blessing of the meal uh, to follow? Father, we thank you for your presence again. We thank you that as we go today, that we go with you. Lord, help us to take these teachings to heart and uh, to join you in the places that you've called us and to realize we have to wear the whole armor of God. I pray for our congregation, I pray that you would give each of us courage to take steps toward you in the various ways that you're calling us. And I pray we would encourage each other in that. There is surely another in the fire standing next to us. Jesus stands with us, but we also stand together. Lord, we also ask your blessing uh, for this school year again and for the food that we are about to eat and the fellowship that we are about to have. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. 
Amen. May you go in peace. Amen.